So looking at uh, attachment styles, basically how we are raised in that parental person, both presence in our life, that primary caregiver, it's kind of the set point of what we see safety and comfort and love as. Right. And then we seek that out in other relationships, whether that be right. personal, whether they be romantic. When you recognize that maybe you have one of these insecure attachment styles, what is the work? Because you said do the work to actually right. become secure. What is that work that we should be doing once we've recognized these patterns in ourselves? Yeah. Uh, so once you recognize the patterns, and I think you know you said something like template. You know, it is kind of a template that you go about life, and to me, it's sort of like an operating system that's always working underneath. And although most of the times we're talking about romantic relationships, like you said, it does affect all the different areas of your life. It affects how you go about goals. It affects how you deal with friendships and family members. It affects how you uh, think about yourself, just in general, your whole self-concept. And so once you recognize the insecure attachment, then it's really about looking at the operating system and essentially changing what's not working, developing a revised operating system that's actually going to work for your life right now as an adult. And so what I have found is that with each insecure attachment type, they have certain different things that are running as their program. So for example, the anxious attached, a lot of what's running in their program is, um, you know, I have to overanalyze everything. That's part of the anxious temperament or, um, I have to save others. I have to, you know, take care of others because otherwise um, they won't take care of me or they won't like me. And so once you realize what these statements are, there's different exercises that you can do to essentially reparent yourself. And that is what I think is really important is that sometimes people will say, well, okay, like I, I get all that and I hear what you're saying and like I've talked to my parents about it and they're just like, what are you talking about? They're clearly not interested in the work and maybe they don't even feel like they want to take responsibility for what they've contributed to my attachment style. But that's okay. The whole idea is that as an adult now, you have more efficacy and you have more control and it's in your hands now. So you can be upset with your parents, but this is not about blaming them because it's right. not going to help you move forward. So what can you do? You have to learn to reparent yourself. You have to reprogram what's happened. And so there's different exercises that we can do from inner child work to mirror work to like shadow work to empty chair exercises. But these are things where you get to confront those areas that have developed from an earlier time, these scripts that probably no longer work in your life, but you're still running those old programs. It's like that like old computer that you're still using, but it's just not working now. And so it is up to you to be able to do those exercises and move forward and develop these new scripts for yourself. So it is important to recognize, as you said earlier, that you know our parents are doing the best they can with what they're given. And yeah. of course, a lot of this information wasn't even available to them around no. raising kids, podcasts, videos, <laughs> right. inner child work. So recognizing that we have to take responsibility and we want to have healthy, happy relationships in our lives. I found in our work that we do as clients is we tend to get a lot of avoidant attachment clients as well, mm. being very goal-driven and yes. lone wolves, as we call them, just yes. happy to push relationships to the side, focus on the task at hand. So walk us through some of these exercises for those in the audience who are avoidant to actually start to work through breaking that pattern and getting to a more secure attachment style in their life? Yeah, this is a great question. You know, And I think, again, the avoidantly attached is interesting because I also talk about the pros of each insecure attachment style because yeah. there's so much about how bad they are uh, that it's important to also recognize their strengths, right? And so interestingly, like you said, avoidantly attached individuals, they are the proverbial lone wolves and they are admired for it. They're admired for their achievements. So it's kind of egocentric to be avoidantly attached. And then obviously when they're not feeling good about themselves, they like just set up another goal and they do it. And people are like, whoa, you're so amazing. amazing you have yeah. all this stuff going on in your personal life and you're still doing it. And so it makes you kind of almost drive even more towards that. But eventually you burn out more your self-concept is obviously not in a great place in that it's always predicated on what you're achieving. And then we all need connection, like even the proverbial lone wolves, even if you say you're a recluse because we're social animals. I mean, that's a lot of what your work is on is trying to help people yeah. recognize that and harness that. And so a lot of the, the exercises for our proverbial lone wolves really have to do with developing healthy interdependence. And so I set up these behavioral experiments for them. I know that you like them too in your yeah. program where you start to little by little, you know, starting with lower stake things like ask people to start helping in different areas of your life. But you start with lower stakes because it's too scary to ask like the big ass of 
most intimate relationships. But you start with that. But you, the important thing is that you actually write your hypothesis beforehand, right? So it's like, what do you think is actually going to happen versus what actually happens? And oftentimes people who have avoidant attachment, they feel like, well, they're not going to be able to do it. Or like, well, they'll do it, but they'll disappoint me. Or like, they'll do it, but then now they're going to think that I suck and I'm, right. I'm weak. I'm weak. Right. And so it's important to write those hypotheses ahead of time because our minds are so powerful that later on after something happens, you're going to create the story right. that still fits your it. current ideas. Yeah. So you have to write it down ahead of time. Then you do the experiment and then you're like, okay, well, what actually happened? And then you look at the discrepancies and you have to start in a logical way, actually make sense of, oh, okay, what's the new idea then to bring into my existing script? So I guess I asked this person for this. I thought that they were totally going to disappoint me. And you know what? They did a pretty good job. Like, could I have done a better job? Maybe, but they did a pretty good job. Yeah. They did a good enough job that I feel more comfortable doing it in the future. You know, with people that you have more intimate relationships with, you can even ask them directly. Like, when I asked you for this, did what did you think of me? You know, people you right, trust, you your feel. friends, close family, romantic partners. And, you know, most of the times you're going to get that feedback of like uh, either nothing or like, well, yeah, obviously you need a lot of help. You have a lot on your plate as opposed to <laughs> you're, you're bothering weak. me. Yeah. yeah, you're bothering me. Exactly. And so I think those behavioral experiments are so important for the avoidant attached because avoidantly attached people are really pragmatic. They tend to be really logical yep. and they don't want like so much emotional content. And so you got to meet the types where they're at. Fit me. 